So this is the final recap for the summer semester outdoor painting class. And we had a, a great last class and I want to talk about some of the things that, that came up during that class and try to consolidate them into a, a brief synopsis. So on this screen, I have kind of a, a general spread of different landscape paintings that came to mind, different landscape uh, artists that came to mind while we were looking at everybody's work laid out in the room, everyone that was able to to come to the last class. And really the the thread of this presentation is about what it means or how we come to share what it is that we're doing um, in this in the in this sense of of making outdoor paintings uh, independently, but then um, several trees away from each other, right? And um, what it, what it, what does it mean to to share this experience together? And how are we going to learn from each other and from each of our um, individual individual journey making paintings outside? And so there's several quick ideas I'll try to lay out here. Um, so if we look at like the landscape painting on the top here by Welliver, an artist from Maine versus the Alex Katz on the right or the uh, Louisa Matthias Doder in the bottom uh, second from left, the Marine landscape or another Alex Katz on the bottom right. And these are all here for the artists in the class that are making more gestural work that has a slightly more monumental feel and is dealing with wet on wet and an economy of language, right? Where there's a, for example, in the Alex Katz, there's a stand-in for a particular depth and kind of, of greenery that, that, that there's a decision that it's going to be this color and this kind of mark. And then that's kind of built up in a pervasive fashion um, to stand for more than what it is in it in a way that was not the best way of explaining that, but um, I'll come back to it. So, so in addition to distilling uh, some, some uh, variation or myriad of, of perceptual experience of distilling that into a single color and a single way of making a mark that brings up the idea of notation. And there's a uh, several artists in the class that are, that are dealing with that. I feel like, which is kind of, finding their sense of, of notating, um, of painting and no, notation. So that's one thing I wanted to talk about. And then the other, the kind of flip side of all of that is someone like Rackstraw Downs in the bottom right-hand corner. And we'll talk about some other artists that are dealing with marking or notating the perceptual experience as the sun passes over us and and what it means to do something like that in terms of labor so you have Cezanne so on the top here so you have this kind of tradition of perceptual experience and small marks accruing and um and what what that what that is like with making landscape painting right i'm just trying to give us a little roadmap of the possibilities and and kind of trying to help us um uh think of landscape painting uh in different ways. So yeah, so I'll move on, move on and try to try to kind of keep this thing alive a little bit. So for example, um, this is Corot on the left. I've showed this painting before, which you could say gets its velvety currency, its velvety texture from a, from a subtle play of tone value and, and, um, uh, and saturation. And, um, you know, he's, for me, he's a goalpost. I've said this before in terms of the history of portable painting and landscape painting and painting outside versus painting in the studio and making composite paintings. And this idea that it is enough to make a, a painting, to go out with a backpack or, or some set of tools, make a painting, bring it back and share it, that that is a, a thing in of itself that we're going to pay attention to. So you, so, He's um, the beginning of, uh, for me, of kind of 
of dealing with that. And that can extend a lot further, right? Like uh, how much attention are we going to pay to a small sketch or, or something like that? So on the right, you have nowadays, you have the 90s, you have the 2000s, you have Rackstraw Downs, who I met in an elevator once in New York City. And um, you also have the idea of painting something that is not necessarily like the the regency is that the word or the the regalia or the uh the special the obvious the the gold the silver the diamond the uh the platter the the proof of wealth right we have just a some kind of object and, and there's there's other things going on here this kind of i don't know some kind of like astronaut trash compactor leftover forgotten uh weather station thing um with this like kind of like gloriously hidden road here that that drifts off into the into the distance here but um my point is that from the barbizon school to um to van gogh or or you know the idea that making a painting is simply the excuse to spend several hours painting a pile of bushes like this 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 right hand corner here um is something to think about, right? Instead of painting, like choosing a scene that is pastoral, what does it mean to choose something that is often thought of as, as boring or pedantic or the thing that you, that only, that you only noticed when you were on the phone, right? That you didn't notice when you were looking for the place to picnic. Um, so these paintings can be, be moments like that. And the more I talk about that idea, the Corot painting, it really starts to speak in that way. Um, this, this beautiful shadow here, um, reminds me of, of that, of the kind of banality of it. Like we could talk about all these different, different ways of talking about the forgotten, the leftover, the, um, everything, but the central focus that has to do with, uh, with like, um, the, the tradition of a uh, of a story with a plot with introduction climax and end um what happens if you take out that middle arc and you make a a painting where you're just kind of looking like what is this corot situation this is this this back road it feels like something that that maybe you know the the architect uh hadn't planned on this image in the uh, in the portfolio right there's this kind of this back path. I think I've belabored the point, but um, that's a part of landscape painting that I want to share with everybody. So here we have uh, Goussaint. I've showed this painting on the left, these kind of magical shifting plays of light. And then you have Rackstraw Downs again on the right, who um, is dealing with this, this perceptual experience and this kind of divergence of using uh, like two eyeballs to perceive in stereo stereoscopic view. Um, so I'm just showing here th these differences because also one of the things that comes up here is we have several students in the class that are dealing with drawing and line versus like a more painterly experience. And so I want to talk about that. Like the, the rack straw downs here uh, smacks of, or, um, rhymes of some actually like Andrew Wyeth or those tempera paintings um, or this Poussin, which is part of this great tradition of line verse, this like kind of like joke of, of drawing versus painting and, and where, where those things uh, cross, like what kind of Venn diagram those things create in a body of work. So the, the Poussin painting um and the and this particular rack straw downs has has this conversation with with drawing and and kind of the the clarity of of the position of the objects in space that it seems like some students desire. Um, this is Rudy Burkhart's paintings. He's more well known for his photography, but this was a from a show that was at the New York studio school that I saw. And one thing that really that I want to talk about. And so we went to a different location, every class. 
and several students are finishing their paintings at home. And I really think what we're going to start doing is um, in the next semester is going to several locations repeatedly and, and developing a relationship with them. And I'm talking about that with respect to Rudy Burkhart, uh, because there's like an intimacy, not only in terms of being in a, in a forest, right. In the shade of the forest, it's not as much of an open Vista, but there is also like a, a sense that he's getting to know this particular species of tree or, or you could pretend that you could go down that road. And I also wanted to talk about the redwoods where we went that, that gave some people a kind of ride for their money in that they were met with, um, with a challenge of, of painting up close of, um, painting somewhere where they might not be able to go again. Um, all of that matters. Right. And we all have to decide for ourselves where we want to paint and, and how to treat that idea of whether this is something that's, that's rather foreign to us or whether we're going to, going to get to know it in a different kind of way. Now we come to the idea that there's, uh, some of the artists in the class are are dealing with not only notation, which I'll get to, but also gesture and distilling a complicated scenario, a play of light. Uh, the landscape, right, is known as this challenge. It's not like painting a cup. Um, there's kind of this infinite variation that um, that gives us the opportunity to deal with what it means to distill that information and to uh, choose some stand-ins that would stand in for for um, a wider array than might than might be assumed or that might be uh, be wanted. So so Alex Katz on the right and Wellover on the left can be thought of in that way, where if we look at this Alex Katz, the entirety of this tree that's kind of bogged in this wetland um, riparian zone is uh, is given, uh, according to this digital environment, is given a, a single color, right? So it feels like a lino cut almost, and the limits of that, uh, even though it's a oil painting, I believe, it might be acrylic, but I think it's an oil painting. So for example, the, the shadow of that tree in this, in this water here is all given another color. And so then the, the artist and our, our perceptions are given the opportunity to, uh, to let, to let that color stand for that whole trunk of tree, right. Which is like an impossible, that's like an entire ecosystem of, of insects and it's a it's a whole world that if if one decided to would open up into um into many different shades of color right if it was um if we allowed ourselves in in that way and so i'm just trying to talk about um the decisions we make to distill a thing and there's several artists that in the class that i feel like could benefit from um looking at that experience also with respect to the to, to challenge and monumentality. For some reason, the students in the class that are dealing with uh, distilling and generalizing are also seem to be interested in, in kind of uh, a more monumental scale and in interested in gesture. So that's why Alex Katz comes up on the right, who's kind of a, a wonderful person to look at in terms of um, kind of a deafness of large gesture and and uh and clarifying maybe so i'll show some more of his later another thing that is happening in the class is that there's some the students that are interested in local color versus a more emotional felt color you could say so you we have this amazing degas pastel on the left versus the classic bonard um inside outside painting on the right where these kind of purples and oranges are pushed and um there's several students that are dealing with this kind of color. And so I want to, to, to give, to give this a position on this kind of crazy map that I'm giving everybody of, of different possibilities for landscape painting. We also showed this book in class. This book happens to be in the classroom. Um, the, the idea of like Rudy Burkhart that I showed at the pine trees that are painted in Maine. Uh, this is Monet familiarizing himself or, or expanding, or how do I put it, sinking his teeth into, or 
allowing himself to, to spend time with something, right. And not, um, not be so flippant about, uh, one day to the next. So this is the, the kind of famous haystack series where he's, he's approaching the same motif from season to season. And we could, we could all think about our works in terms of this. Like what if you spent the whole semester dealing with a particular kind of middle ground, or there was always a, a tree on the left or, or, um, we should think about that for ourselves and talk about that with our peers about what we're working on in terms of, um, in terms of this dance of what we're going to paint each day from, from day to day and week to week. Now we have Graham Nixon, who was a, a teacher of mine and we have a watercolor of his on the right and a, a painting of his on the left. He is one of these proponents of a, of a felt color rather than a local color. Uh, part of this Bonard tradition. I love how this this tree of birds or this birds of tree. <laughs> um, this is, these are some of his classic moves. This kind of teal purple, uh, similar value hue shift. These grays become more luscious the more you more you look at at this painting. And then on the right we have. Um, Again, back to this kind of Corot, Cezanne, perceptual track or, or tendril of the history of landscape painting, we have someone like Rackstraw Downs, who actually recently was in an ex exhibition with Rackstraw Downs at the Betty Cunningham Gallery in New York, um, who was involved in, in in sitting outside and painting uh, a single a single view repeatedly and over time. These are actually on cut up canvas. Some of them are on paper even. Um, they're they're kind of detail oriented, which is which could be a, a great avenue for some of the students to look at, um, as opposed to the, the very gesture distilled moments that I just showed in the Alex Katz and which I will show in Fairfield Porter. Uh, this is another way of thinking about the color that I wanted that I was showing with Bonard, and um, this is Odilon Redon, um, of I believe he's French from the kind of impressionist symbolist moment uh, where you have these kinds of purples and, and oranges and teals pushed. There's a couple of students I really want, want to see these, these images. And of course you can pause this video at any, any point, right? I'm kind of cruising through these paintings. So Fairfield Porter's on the left. I really wanted to introduce his paintings to several of the students in terms of this idea of gesture and paint wet on wet and, um, and distilling and note taking. And on the right, we have Alex Katz. This is the painting. I believe that was on the first slide. And it's just really fun to compare. Like, let's look at this field of green that at first glance, right. It has a quick read. That's another thing to say. This painting has a quick read at first glance. But um, as we sit here, is it subtle? Um, is it ironic? Is it uh, is it patient? You know, how does this shadow, how does that shadow relate? This is a fun thing to do. How does that shadow relate to this shadow on this house? How does that feel? Do you feel like you could have, been here you are here and we talked about in that in the class about how some students want their work to feel like um the viewer is there that that is a uh, a way of thinking about things and then if i look at this field how does that compare to fairfield porter's field of sky and so this is another part we're just talking about how the paintings talk to each other both formally if you want to make a distinction between formal and and content um and content wise and so one of the things i talked about was you know we 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 did things like we imagined a gallery show of our work and if you have a wall of paintings that are all from one location a wall of paintings that are maybe all about um something about space like we could choose something iconic like a, a deep space or we could we could choose something 
a little more particular and unique? Like what about the space of, of rummaging in a fridge for, um, for the plums in the ice box? Uh, something like that, like that kind of architecture, or what about the space of a, a fly flying around, um, a cluttered or not, let's say a fly, I don't know, flying around a candle. Um, I'm just talking about, so we, we, we had this gallery idea and we were, we were kind of choosing, or, or I was talking about this idea of choosing walls that had different themes. And, um, the idea of that is, you know, we also had students like choose a work that they felt like had the most space or choose a work that they wanted to look at more. And we made these kind of little collections and we talked about them. And one, one way of one reason for doing that was, um, to bring up the idea of like, uh, what are we learning from our peers? And do you, do you choose something that you couldn't possibly imagine inhabiting or like a hat that you couldn't imagine wearing? Or do you choose something that, um, you, you want more of in your life that you want your work to more look more like, right? So, so this idea can be really opened up uh, the, what kind of attraction or gravitational pull um, our peers work has for us or different artists through history have for us. Um, here's another kind of distillation pairing. We have Louisa Matthias Doder on the right and these, uh, these blocks of, of color. And on the left, we have Richard Diebenkorn, which I've been meaning to share with everybody. And I don't have a book of his. So I really want uh, some of the students to see, see him. He's part of the Bay area artists that, um, since we're, we're near there, it's, it's good to, to take a look at him. And then we get into this kind of more traditional watercolor zone of singer sergeant on the left and um on the right we have winslow homer and the the point of these slides is a lot of times what comes up is uh talking about getting it right and i want to bring up like sure we can pay attention to getting it right in terms of shape and line but we're also at the point in this class where you could sidestep that for a month or two and say, what about if I, I'm trying to get the color right or, or the light right, um, whatever right means. So a lot of times we'll sidestep right um, in, in different ways. But uh, what if what if you chose another formal quality that, that could be interesting um, for some of, the, some of the students? This is Fairfield Porter on the left with this kind of yellow anomaly in the foreground and again a kind of painterly quality that pushes towards um something a little bit more i don't know it's fun to talk about monumental versus intimate with respect to this these this work um and then you have Cezanne on the right again part of a perceptual tradition um and again, he's getting to know this mountain. And I wanted to talk about how a work can feel like it's falling apart or coalescing and how, you know, we, we push some of our works too far sometimes and, and let's, uh, let's witness them for a little while when they don't quite make sense, when they don't quite add up, when they don't quite get where we imagined we wanted them to to arrive at and and what does it feel like to to leave them open to leave them unfinished um how do they how do they taste uh, in that in that um in that part of uh part of the cooking process this is fairfield porter again two views from above from from a from a kind of above angle yeah and then, you know like this 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 presentation you know if if you don't you don't have to listen to all these kinds of content ideas. Also just what about changing up the angle that you make your paintings from? What about this kind of a limited palette? Um, what about this, this idea of color and light? Um, this is Fairfield Porter again. And, you know, like there's also things like humor, like this, this chimney shadow, there's some, there's something about that to me that feels like humor, but then, 
we slip into the subtleties, these kind of like Edward Hopper, um, plainer color shifts, but there's the, 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 this kind of dance of yellows really, really brings me, brings me back to this rack straw downs. Like, let's take a look at the way he deals with reflected kind of moments that are repeated forms. So I'm just kind of bouncing back and forth and looking at how these works share with one another. And I always like to give a sense of scale in the digital realm, you know, but here we have, you could say that, you know, the sky shifts from a light to a dark here, but this whole, this whole mess of a tree is, is been boiled down to a, uh, to a couple of colors, right? Um, this house has been given some kind of a, a world of a, like a monochromatic, like almost like the floor in this, uh, the floor and walls in this, this room. Um, there's another Fairfield Porter. I think he's really instructive for us right now because of the, the dexterity, you know, this is kind of like a moss laden tree with these little feet pinned up on this chair and these funny birds, but there's this, this flexibility of opacity and kind of brushiness and, you know, what about making very clear decisions, making confused decisions and, uh, not making decisions at all. <laughs> what about all of that in the process of painting? Louisa Matthias Doder again. This kind of series of puzzle pieces. What about making a painting that feels like a puzzle? Um, this is a watercolor by Fairfield Porter. What about watercolors in your work being a place for something totally different than what you do with oil and acrylic? What about it being kind of like a, a foray into another identity for yourself? This is an awesome Alex Katz. Alex Katz is more known for the figure paintings and uh, the landscapes are really special that he made in Maine. And these are, this is Richard Diebenkorn with this, this crazy composition of this kind of bisected um, knife edge. And yeah, I think that's, I think we're, I think I've, I've, I think I've gone through it. I think I've given, I think I've shown the paintings I wanted to show. Um, let me just look at my notes. One thing, uh, just to mention the Redwoods, I don't know if I talked about that already, but, you know, challenging ourselves in scenes that we're not used to. If we've always been painting vistas and pastoral, why not paint dark and closed in for a little bit? Um, yeah, I think I'm going to, I'm going to leave us there and it's been a really great class. And I just, um, I wanted to, to make sure to, uh, to, to show some of these artists that I haven't um, brought books in about. And yeah, as always, if you have any questions, reach out to me and thanks again for a really great, a great class. Everyone was really brave and, um, for sharing their work and their ideas. And, uh, 